Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Corey Wren. I am the current TerraCorps member at Mount Grace, the Land Stewardship Coordinator. And we're here to host a webinar in part of our um, Citizen Science Naturalist series that we've been doing. And tonight I would like to introduce Russ Cohen, who has served as the Rivers Advocate for the Mass Department of Fish and Games Division of Ecological Restoration, where um, his expertise was in riparian vegetation, but now he's able to pursue his passion, which is uh, taste buds, pun intended. And he offers in-person wild edible walks and talks. However, tonight will be more like a talk. And um, he will be performing his role of the Johnny Appleseed currently for us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Russ Cohen. Thank you, Corey. So hi, everyone. And, uh, <clears throat> and although this is the ninth uh, uh, online presentation I've done since, uh, you know, our new reality such as it is set in, uh, you know, I haven't done an in-person program since March the 5th. Uh, but I am expecting to do some in-person outdoor wild edibles uh, programs beginning at the end of this month. So uh, at the end of this slide so show, you'll see a link to my uh, website and also Corey, when he sends a follow-up thank you message, will also share that with you so you get a chance to see that. And, uh, and maybe I will see you uh, out in the field sometime uh, now that uh, we can do that at a at a you know, careful uh, protocol. So anyway, but here's our virtual foraging show we're gonna do, and I'm gonna focus on just um, uh, wild edibles that are available in the summer in the North Quabbin area, because uh, I was asked to limit my show to 60 minutes, and that's how I'm gonna do it. So I'm gonna talk about edible wild plants and mushrooms. So before I plunge into the show, I wanna cover one basic topic. Just how risky is it to put a wild edible in your mouth? Could you get sick? Could you even die? And the answer is different depending upon whether you're talking about a wild plant or a mushroom. For plants, there are a few exceptions to this and the few exceptions tend to be plants in the carrot or parsley family and the two very dangerous members of that family that grow wild in the North Quabbin area are poison hemlock and water hemlock. And these are plants that are potentially deadly. But, um, but the vast majority of poisonous plants that grow in this region and New England in general taste horrible. So my advice is don't eat plants that taste bad. Think of your taste buds as a backup identification tool. So, um, so I did not learn this stuff by walking down the trail, popping stuff in my mouth and see what happens. I mean, all that uh, trial and error work has been done by Native Americans, and many other people over eons. We can benefit from that accumulated knowledge. But it means that if you see a plant that you think is edible, that you remember from this uh, online talk, you read about in a book, whatever, you think you've got the right thing and you're prepared according to instructions and you take a bite and it doesn't taste good, I suggest that you don't override the danger signal your taste buds might be giving you. You made, made, might have made a mistake in identification. But for plants, um, uh, you know, even if there's some toxic principles in there, it is very likely, speaking frankly, that you would poop out the poison or puke out the poison before you'd have any permanent damage. So, uh, so the risk of getting very sick from eating wild plants, I think is relatively low, especially if you don't eat plants that taste bad. However, for mushrooms, that rule does not apply. There are some mushrooms out there that are potentially deadly and there's nothing whatsoever from the flavor that gives you any advanced warnings. You could have this delicious mushroom meal one day and be dead several days later from liver and or kidney failure. So the risk of eating the wrong kind of mushroom and getting very sick or possibly even dying is much more significant than for plants. Having said that, you can arrange all the mushroom species that are on a line and cluster to one end of those species that are virtually impossible to confuse with anything poisonous versus those at the other end of the line that even the experts can't tell apart. And as long as you stay at the safe end of the line and you gradually work your way out as you gain experience and confidence, that's how you stay out of trouble. So we are gonna talk about mushrooms in the show today. And I'm gonna confine my remarks to mushrooms that tend to be on the very easy to identify uh, part of the scale. Um, 
So with that, I'm going to activate my screen here and plunge into my PowerPoint. So let's do that. Okay, and I'm just gonna hide my uh, bar here. Hold on just a second. Come on, come back on. All right, and come on. Sorry. I've done this enough, you'd think I would have this all done. So let me uh, try again. Okay, so hide floating panel controls. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to just move myself way off to the edge here if I can. There we go. All right, excellent. So let me go up a slide. Okay, so here's the uh, title slide. And here we go. So it's summer. So what might be available in the summer? Well, one plant that is is called Juneberry, but actually the best time to find Juneberry, and this is the genus Amelanchy, you might know this as Shadbush or Shadblow, is actually in the spring when the plants are blooming because they bloom very early. Um, so you can often spot them in the landscape. But this is a plant that I uh, that you don't have to go way off in the wilderness somewhere to find. Uh, I often see this plant planted in parks in other landscaped areas. So, so you spot it when it's blooming, and then in the June, you want June or in July in the North Quabbin area, you can still find ripe fruit. The fruit will look like this, and this is a ripe one. This is this fruit is one day from being ripe. When it's actually purpley, that's when it's ripe. And this fruit looks a lot like blueberries, but it actually tastes like a cross between cherries and almonds. They're actually related to cherries and almonds. And it's a great plant for stuffing your face right by the bush um, or making stuff from the fruit. So in my foraging book, which I'll talk about at the end, I've got a recipe for Juneberry uh, muffins where you can use fresh Juneberries, dried Juneberries, or frozen Juneberries, and it comes out uh, any of those ways. And also it's a great, if you dry the fruit, it's a great ingredient in uh, granola. So that is our Juneberry. And mulberries are ripe around the same time. Sometimes I often find them growing near together. And uh, mulberries will vary in flavor from tree to tree. So what you wanna do is just try a fruit. And sometimes they're insipid, which means they're sweet without any tartness. And uh, I think the best tasting fruit are the ones that are sweet and tart together. And they tend to be the purpley black colored mulberries. Although a tree like that is probably still a white mulberry. It will have purple to black fruit. And just, you know, keep, once you see mulberries and the way you often discover them is you'll be walking or riding your bike along and you see this area of the pavement that's stained purple. And then you look up and you see where the fruit have been dropping on the pavement. And this is another one that the birds uh, happily eat, but there's usually tons of fruit in this plant. So you can just uh, eat all you want. And I like to mix mulberries and juneberries together. So like for strudel, uh, they're a good combination. So wild strawberries is uh, something that should be available in North Quabbin right now. I still have it in my uh, nursery outside of Boston. So uh, you wanna look for the white flowers. Uh, well, ideally it would have been three or four weeks ago is when you look for the flowers and then the fruit follows pretty shortly thereafter. And wild strawberries are small. So each one of these strawberries is only about a half an inch long, but what they lack in size, they make up for in yumminess. And I've seen places in the North Quabbin uh, where uh, there are hundreds of these strawberries growing in a lawn. And it's really fun to just sprawl on that lawn and just, uh, just immerse yourself in the, the aroma and the flavor of these wild strawberries. It's really great. And wild strawberries is also a great plant for playing in your own yard, if, especially if you have a lawn. Wild strawberries don't mind getting mowed. They don't mind getting stepped on. And it's a great way to diversify your lawn beyond just grass because you've got these white flowers the pollinators will visit. And then a plant you can eat too. You can also make tea from wild strawberry leaves when the leaves are fresh or thoroughly dried. Apparently when they're wilted, they're slightly toxic, but fresh or thoroughly dried is fine. And the tea you make from the leaves does taste at least vaguely like the fruit and it does have vitamin C in it. So if you felt a case of scurvy coming on, you could rush out and make yourself some strawberry leaf tea. All right, here's a plant that most of you will know, uh, jewelweed, and most of you might know that it is an antidote to uh, the rash and poison ivy. And it has been clinically proven to work for some people. 
I'm apparently not one of those people, but it does work for some people. And especially this time of year when the plants are nice and juicy and succulent, you just take the entire plant and scrunch it up, get the juice out and apply that juice either where you have poison ivy, where you think are exposed to poison ivy. And then it's even possible that it might have a prophylactic effect in actually if you apply it to your skin before you touch poison ivy, it might reduce the likelihood that you get poison ivy. So that's pretty cool. And if you want that remedy available year round, what you can do is just take a bunch of the jewelweed plants and bring them home and uh, um, throw them in a blender or throw them in a pot with some water. And then just take that liquid and pour it into ice cube trays and freeze it. And then you could just take an ice cube and put that on your skin. And some people claim the jewelweed juice is good for all kinds of skin irritations, even athlete's foot. Okay, but this is a show about edible wild plants and the main edible part on a jewelweed are the seeds, the ripe seeds that are enclosed in seed pods that look like this. So there probably are some seed pods right now that are at this stage, but as the summer goes on, these will become more and more numerous. The tricky part is to catch these seeds because when the seed pod is ripe, it will detonate at the slightest touch. For one of the nicknames this plant is touch me up because if you brush against the plant with the ripe seeds on there, they start going, psh, 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 they shoot all over the place. So what you need to do if you want to eat one of these, uh, if you want to eat some jewelweed seeds is sneak up on one of these ripe seed pods and grab it and have it explode in your hand. Don't worry, it won't hurt. So there's a ripe seed pod. And then when it explodes, it does all this business. And then letter D are what the ripe seeds look like. And if you eat them, they taste just like walnuts, like store-bought English walnuts. They're diminutive, they're small, they're a little bigger than sesame seeds. So uh, you probably won't fill up on jewelweed seeds, but it is a fun thing to nibble on uh, as you encounter them on the trail. Another fun thing to do with these seeds, and you don't need to do this to eat them, but just to see, is if you gently rub the outer seed covering off, just rub this part off, the inner seed color, is this beautiful, bright robin's egg blue color. And I have no idea why that color's in there because no creatures ever see it. It's just one of those unexplained mysteries of mother nature. All right, here's purslane. If you are a vegetable gardener, you probably are seeing this as a weed in your garden. And I dare say that this plant could possibly be more, more nutritious than the crops that you're growing. Jewelweed is very high in omega-3 fatty acids and it's also high in iron. So it's a nutritious plant to eat. You can eat it raw, you can eat it cooked. These stems, if they get big enough, sometimes people will pickle them. And, um, and jewelweed uh, is great just thrown into a salad. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a great way to use jewelweed that requires no cooking skill whatsoever if you decide to just do the lazy person's version, is you can throw the purslane leaves into a gazpacho. And you don't even have to make the gazpacho. Of course, you're welcome to do that. But you could go to the organic farm stand and just buy their prepared gazpacho and then just throw the purslane leaves in there. And the texture of the purslane works really well in a gazpacho. So this is your classic summer weed. It won't show up in the cool weather this spring. It waits for the hot weather this summer to come out. Okay, so daylilies are out now. They're blooming at home. And see this with caution business. I'll get to that at the end. So daylily tubers are edible. The young shoots are edible. The daylily uh, buds are edible. Whoops, sorry, let me go back here. Okay, whoops, what happened? Sorry, all right. So daylily flower buds are edible. The open flowers are edible. And even the wilted flowers are edible. Um, you add the wilted flowers to soups and stews to flavor and thicken them. And you can eat the daylily petals raw. Um, or you could fry them in tempura batter in the buds. You see here on the right, I've just sauteed these daylily flower buds for a few minutes in some butter and they taste like oniony green beans. All right, so here is the with caution part. There's two things to be cautious about. First thing is, I'm only talking about the tall orange daylilies. I'm not talking about any of the other fancier kinds that you might uh, encounter in a horticultural context. I'm talking about the wild daylilies you see along the roadside by, by an old house foundation that are tall and orange. So those are the ones I can say are safely edible with one other additional caveat. And that is for a relatively small segment of the population. So it's about 
it's less than 20% of the population. There is a chemical in daylilies that might not agree with your digestive system. So if you eat daylilies, you might find out that you have, that you feel nauseous and or you have a loose bowel movement afterwards, but you'll get better right away. You'll feel better right away. You're not gonna have flashbacks in or anything afterwards. You just know that daylilies don't agree with your digestive system. So this seems to be most triggered by eating the raw tubers, but it's possible that other parts of the plant might do it too. Um, it's possible though that you've already eaten daylilies and not know it because daylily flowers are a standard ingredient, dry daylily flowers are a standard ingredient in two Chinese food dishes, mushu and hot and sour soups. So if you've eaten those dishes, haven't that problem, probably okay with eating daylilies that you pick yourself. Okay, we've covered jewelweed. All right, so when I make a uh, when I make stuff from wild ingredients, I'm not a purist about it. I don't insist that every single ingredient in a recipe be wild. So, like when I make that strudel I showed you before, I don't have to use yak butter for this strudel. I can use regular butter, regular sugar, and that's fine. And the wild filling makes it a wild dish. So uh, you can do the same thing with a salad too. So in this case, I decided to go completely, everything in here is wild except for the croutons, but I don't mean to deter you from making your own salad just from, uh, uh, by throwing a few violet flowers. So violet is a spring flower, so I'm not talking about it in this show. Wild mustard, that's a su summer flower. So you could certainly use that as a summer ingredient in a salad. And then uh, these little red berries are partridge berries. And these little tomato-like things, these are ground cherries. These are both available in the summer. So that's what partridge berries look like. They're very common in North Quab and especially underneath pine trees or hemlock trees. These red berries have virtually no flavor. So why use them? Because they're pretty. So I'll just put a few on top of a salad just to add that nice color in there. And then the ground cherry is a wild cousin of a tomato. So the fruit develops in something like this, botanically that's called a calyx. And when this thing ripens, this outer part turns a tan color and this entire thing falls off the plant on the ground. So that's why this is called a ground cherry because when you encounter these plants, you wanna look for the right fruit, look for them on the ground underneath the plants, the fruits that have already fallen off the plant. And then you see how there's a husk surrounding the fruit. You cannot see this fruit unless you peel that husk off, all right? This is important because there are poisonous lookalikes to uh, ground cherries where you can just see yellow fruit on the plant. That's probably the poisonous horse nettle. Uh, it's a thorny plant where the fruit tastes horrible, so I'm not worried about you making a mistake. But look for ground cherries where you have to take off this calyx, this husk part, to eat it. And then um, uh, ground cherry tastes like a sweet cherry tomato, so they're quite good. And uh, these are grown by a lot of organic farms and others, and you see them at farmer's markets, but they do also grow wild in Massachusetts. So here's a fun member of the Rubus genus. This is the flowering raspberry. Um, it probably looks like this right now in North Quabbin with these very showy, pretty flowers. So this is also a great plant for planting in your own yard, especially if you have got a, a damp spot uh, with dappled sunlight, that's where the flowering raspberry likes to grow because it's got these enormous maple-like leaves, these gorgeous flowers. And by the way, there's no thorns on this plant. So that's another good thing when it comes time to picking the fruit, which looks like that. And this fruit's edible. It's not very juicy. Probably a red raspberry is a yummier fruit, but these are perfectly edible. And, um, and yes, you can find these in uh, North Quabbin area uh, later on during the summer. Uh, what's ripe now, or very soon to now, are these black raspberries. And I don't need to tell you what to do with black raspberries. I'm sure you can figure that out on your own. One cool thing about the black raspberry species is what it looks like in the off season. The canes turn this fun purpley color. And so this is a great plant to look for, even in the middle of the winter with the snow all over the place. If you're out cross country skiing or walking your dog, whatever, and you see these thorny purple canes, those are black raspberries. Remember where that spot is and then go back in late June, early July and look for the fruit. <clears throat> okay, we've got several different kinds of wild cherries that uh, grow in the North Quabbin area. This is the first one to become ripe. This is called a pin cherry or a fire cherry, mainly from the color, but also to some extent, these trees are pioneer species and they will colonize an area that's been burnt over. And you can see when uh, you find a tree that's producing heavily, there are a lot of cherries on this tree. So that part's good. These cherries are small though. They're about a quarter inch in diameter. The pits inside each fruit are small, but there's not a lot of fruit pulp on these fruits. So 
Um, so I certainly wouldn't recommend actually using any wild cherry for any recipe that required pitting each individual fruit because that would be exceedingly tiresome, especially so with these fire pin cherries. But this is a fun one to just nibble on as you encounter it in the wild. And it's got a pretty decent flavor um, uh, just straight into your mouth. So, uh, so this is the fire cherry. So this one's ripe in July. And then what's ripe in August is the choke cherry. And these tend to be shrubby bushes. So you often see them maybe along rural roadsides, pretty sunny areas, pretty common sight. And it's not unusual to find them bearing this heavily. And this fruit is ripe. It's maroon color and it's kind of a dull maroon color. And it's called choke cherry just because these berries are really puckery. So they make your cheeks cave in if you eat them raw. So if you cook them, that aspect of the plant largely goes away. And so uh, that is, so they make an excellent jelly and there's other ways to use the cooked fruit. So that is our choke cherry. And then there's black cherry, which uh, looks a lot like the choke cherry, but this fruit is shiny and black when it's ripe, but it's also on this raceme, the central stalk, like the choke cherries are. And you can see a black cherry has got a lot longer and pointier leaf than the choke cherry does. And these could be big, tall trees, like 40 or 50 feet tall, but they often have branches that are low enough to reach the fruit on the ground. And black cherries can be really yummy straight off the tree. They will vary in flavor from tree to tree. So just keep trying them. And eventually I think you'll be lucky enough to find a tree where the fruit is quite good, uh, just about as good as a cultivated cherry, except for the fact that the cherries are small, but they're still yummy and fun to just stuff your face right by the tree. You can make uh, cherry soup or uh, cherry cordials, um, uh, cherry jam jelly, stuff like that from the black cherry. Here's black huckleberry and this is, uh, pretty common plant in Massachusetts as a whole. So that includes North Quabbin. And I'm sure a lot of people pick these thinking these are blueberries and there's absolutely no harm in that. They're related to blueberries. Um, blueberries often grow nearby, the low bush blueberries. Uh, these fruits tend to be a little waterier and seedier than blueberries, but other than that, they're perfectly good. And, um, and here's the blue huckleberry. So I tend to see these in uh, a little uh, damper habitat than the black huckleberries. And one thing, the fun thing about the blue huckleberries is these fruit will ripen later and they can often still be around in September when just about any other blueberry type fruit is gone, you can still find these blue huckleberries. So that's good. All right, so here's our common elderberry. So in uh, Eastern Mass, these are blooming right now. If they're not in North Quabbin yet, it's going to be very, very soon you'll see masses of flowers like this. Now, some people like to gather these flowers and make drinks from them. There's an alcoholic version and a non-alcoholic version. And then some people like to gather these flowers and fry them in fritter batter. But uh, I actually think there's another flower. It's out of season right now, but uh, around Memorial Day or early June, the black locust flower, I think makes a much tastier fritter than these elderberry flowers. And the other problem about picking the flowers off the plant uh, is um, uh, that you won't get any fruit. Every flower cluster you pick off, it's not going to uh, produce any fruit there. So I tend to leave the flowers on the plant. And so um, uh, I wait for the fruit to show up. And that's what the fruit looks like. And that photo isn't upside down. That's what the berry clusters tend to do from the weight of the fruit is hang upside down like that. And uh, I understand that you can get a stomach ache from eating a lot of raw elderberries, but if you cook them first or dry them first, you can eat all you want. And I tend to mix elderberries and apples together. So like elderberry apple sauce, elderberry apple pie is more interesting than just plain applesauce or apple pie. Okay, here's spice bush. There's a ton of this plant in Eastern Mass, uh, perhaps more than North Quabbin. And one of the reasons for that is we have no predators in Eastern Mass, not enough to keep down our deer population. And, we, and you know, we're very suburban, so we don't uh, have a lot of opportunities for hunting deer. So the deer are laying waste to our landscape in terms of eating all the plants that they like. And what they tend to leave behind is spice bush. So there's some places in Eastern Mass where the dominant understory plant is spice bush because the deer have eaten everything else. So as a result though, you have lots of spice bush. So um, one edible part on the spice bush are the twigs and you can use these year round is you can just steep the twigs in hot water for a few minutes and make a, uh, 
uh, spicy beverage. This is something that the American colonists did when they were boycotting the British tea during the Revolutionary War era. So that's why I'm calling it a revolutionary tea up here. Um, uh, but my favorite part to eat on the plant are these berries. And I use them as a savory spice, but not a sweet spice like black pepper, Szechuan peppercorn. So I'll gather up some of these berries and I will uh, dry them and they get uh, dark red and wrinkly. But once they're dried, you can just store them in a, in a little glass jar in your pantry and they'll keep for years until you're ready to use them. And then when you're ready to use them, just grind up a few in a mortar and pestle and then just add them to your savory dish, your soup, your omelet, your casserole, something like that to get that nice spicy savory flavor in there. So as I'm indicating at the bottom of this slide, uh, spice bush comes in male and female plants. You'll only find berries in the female plants. And let me also say that a lot of our native species like spice bush have important ecological functions. And one of the functions for this plant is those berries are, are high in lipids, that's uh, vegetable fats. And the songbirds know this, and so they will seek out ripe spice bush berries to eat to help fuel their southward migration. So if you are going to pick wild uh, spice bush berries from plants in the wild, I encourage you to use some forbearance and restraint when you're gathering these fruits just to make sure that there's plenty of the fruits left over so the songbirds can eat all they need to serve their needs. And another cool thing that you might encounter on a spice bush plant is this critter. This is a spice bush wild tail butterfly caterpillar. Uh, that has developed all kinds of ingenious disguises to avoid being eaten. So after the egg hatches, when the caterpillar first emerges and it's only about a half an inch long, it looks just like bird poop. So that's a clever disguise. And then it quickly morphs into this form. These are fake eyes. These are fake eye patches. The real eyes are down here. The caterpillar is trying to impersonate a snake to deter birds from eating it. And then after it pupates, even the pupa stage, it looks just like a dried leaf. So isn't it amazing? that this organism has developed all these uh, really ingenious disguises to avoid being eaten. So yeah, so it's fun to uh, see a uh, uh, spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. So if you do see spice bush or sassafras in the summer and you encounter these plants, look for a curled up leaf and very gently cur uh, uh, pull that curl apart. And inside you'll often find one of these caterpillars hiding. So that's another thing it does to deter being eaten. So here's Indian cucumber, and this can be an uncommon plant in certain areas, but I have seen in certain places in the North Quabbin where there are hundreds of these plants as a, you know, a quite common forest understory plant. Because one of the things about Indian cucumber is you actually have to kill an individual plant to get the edible part, which is this root. So I uh, am actively discouraging you from harvesting Indian cucumbers unless you're seeing many, many of these plants together. So uh, 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 do that. And then, you know, uh, just harvest a few of them. Enjoy the wonderful starchy cucumber flavor of these roots. But, um, but it's good to uh, not pick too many as to not uh, upset the ecological balance with this plant. And actually, I'm showing you when the plant has ripe berries at this stage. This might be a good time ecologically to harvest it because after you pull up an individual plant, you can just take these ripe berries and drop them in the hole. That's what ginseng hunters do, the responsible ones. And that would be a way to help the plant uh, uh, perpetuate itself, even though you've pulled up a plant. There's another ecological issue you have to worry about with Indian cucumber, and that is there's a rare orchid that you don't want to pick by mistake, and it's called the small world pagonia. And this one does occur in the North Quabbin and areas around the North Quabbin. So this is a protected plant. You could actually be breaking the law if you harvested this one by mistake. You can see the flowers look very different, uh, but these leaves look quite similar. So the botanical name for Indian cucumber is Mediola virginiana. The botanical name for the swallow mold world begonia is Isatria medioloides, which means looks like Indian cucumber. So how do you tell them apart? Well, uh, the way that I do it is you see that uh, the larger Indian cucumber plants have this double-decker thing going on. We have a war like that and then another section of stem. Whoops another section of stem, and then a second whorl of leaves where the flowers and berries form. So if you're only harvesting the double-decker Indian cucumber plants, you'll never pick the rare orchid by mistake. So that's the advice I'm giving you. All right, here's sweet fern. This is another plant the colonists turned to to make tea from. During the Revolutionary War era, you could just uh, throw these leaves under some hot water and steep them for a few minutes. 
And although I haven't uh, um, eaten a lot of these, the nutlets, which you be, should be able to see on the plant, uh, will be edible soon in the North Quabbin area. And that's a fun thing to nibble on as you encounter this plant in the wild. And the place to look for these plants is very poor soil, like old gravel pits, because this plant can grow in really poor soil because it can make its own nitrogen fertilizer. All right, this is Monarda fistulosa. So uh, this is one of our native wild mints. And um, this one tastes like oregano. And so you could use the Monarda fistulosa leaves or the flowers as an oregano substitute, like it's a pizza topping or sausage making or soups, omelets, casserole, stuff like that. And, uh, and like most mints, uh, the Monarda fistulosa is very popular with pollinators too. So this is a plant, if you want to plant plants in your yard that are edible and have important ecological roles, this would be a good one to consider. And same thing for sweet goldenrod. So this is a licorice flavored goldenrod, uh, the flowers and the leaves. And uh, so what you want to do if you're wondering if a plant you're encountering in the wild is a sweet goldenrod, look for leaves that have no teeth See how this leaf has no teeth and it will have parallel veins in the leaf and just scrunch up a leaf and sniff it. And if you get the licorice smell, you have the sweet goldenrod. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can make tea from this one too. It's very easy to propagate from seed. Uh, the plants that bloom and produce seed and the seed would drop into the pot, that same plant will produce um, little sweet goldenrod plants the very same growing season. So, uh, it's, this is one I'm actively growing in my nursery. It's quite easily, easy. So wintergreen, really common plant in the North Quabbin. You can make tea from these leaves by making a sun tea, putting them in a jar full of water and sticking the jar in the sun for a couple of days. And these berries have a wintergreen flavor. They're not very sweet, but they do have the wintergreen flavor. But if I want to make a wintergreen flavored tea, I tend to make it from black or yellow birch, which is just a botanical coincidence has the same uh, or the wintergreen flavor in the twigs right here. So you just peel the twigs and take the peeled twigs and the peelings. You can do this any time of year and just put them in the jar full of water and just let it sit around for an hour. You don't even have to put it out in the sun and you get a strong wintergreen beverage that way. And yes, you can tap birch trees for sap like a maple tree. This is not a summer thing to do. This is a spring thing to do. So I'm not going to talk about that and to talk about summer edibles. And yes, you can grow birch from seeds and you gather the seeds in the winter. They just show up on the surface of the snow and sow them on the surface of the ground because they need light to generate. And that's another fun one I'm growing in my nursery. Oops. Let's talk about uh, viburnums. So there are no poisonous species of viburnums. They don't all taste good. So like uh, maple leaf viburnum fruit doesn't taste good. Arrowwood fruit doesn't taste good, but there are several that do taste good. Wild raisin fruit tastes good. So it's these purpley black ones that are the ripe ones and they do taste somewhat like raisins. Nanny berry fruits taste good. So these are bigger. So that's one nice thing about it. My favorite tasting uh, viburnum genus plant is the hobble bush of viburnum lantanoides. It used to be viburnum alnifolium. And there's the ripe fruit. It's black when it's ripe. And it tastes, uh, the texture is kind of like stewed prunes with an additional kind of clovey, uh, spicy aftertaste. So they're really fun to nibble on. And, uh, and they will be ripe uh, in mid-September. So I've definitely seen those in the North Quabbin. So uh, I, uh, that's a fun thing to look forward to as you're uh, walking along the trail later on in the summer. And another reason you might want to plant them is they are a gorgeous fall foliage plant. Okay, now we're finally gotten to mushrooms. Okay, this mushroom is way at the safe end of the line. The only lookalike to this species of mushroom is another edible mushroom. So this is called the sulfur shelf mushroom, also called the chicken mushroom sometimes, because if you break this mushroom apart and you look at the inner uh, mushroom meat, it looks just like the breast meat of a chicken. So the way to distinguish this mushroom from other mushrooms is the top layer is pumpkin orange color. The underside, this is bright yellow like the sulfur used to work with in chemistry cl class, that color. And then it grows in shells directly on wood, um, uh, sometimes a live tree, but often it will be a dead tree or a stump or a log. And that's where to see the sulfur shelf mushroom. And this is a nice young one. So uh, the best part of a sulfur shelf is just to trim this tender, very tender, soft 
uh, meat off of it. You don't have to take the entire mushroom, just trim the, the yummy tender part off. And then you could treat it just like uh, chicken. So you could make self or shelf fajitas, self or shelf paprikai, self or shelf tetrazzini. Um, uh, so my, my only advice for cooking this one is to cook it a little bit longer, a little bit slower, uh, 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 sorry, a little bit lower temperature than a standard store-bought mushroom, and uh, it should tenderize well. There are a few people that get digestive upset from eating this one, but that's just a transitory thing. Uh, there's no poisonings. It's just a, you know, an idiosyncratic problem that will go away after a couple hours, and you'll just find out if you're one of those people. So... Um, uh, do avoid sulfur shelves that grow on hemlock trees. Those do seem to be problematic. But usually sulfur shelves are growing on oak trees. That's where I typically find them. And they have a long season of availability. So I've already found sulfur shelves this season that were occurring in the spring. But this photo I took in October. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for these. And uh, they are relatively common. And uh, they're easy to see. The one last identifying characteristic I forgot to mention is that if, if you look on the underside of this mushroom, you see no gills. Gills are the things that radiate out like the spokes of a wheel under the cap of a standard store-bought mushroom. So uh, no gills on these. This is a polypore mushroom, so the, the mushroom is just dropping out of the pores in the bottom. That's how it propagates itself. All right, and here is the lookalike. So this is a related species where instead of orange and yellow, the color is more pink and white. And this species grows in the ground next to the oak tree. And likewise, you just trim this tender part off. And this is at least as tasty as the orange and yellow version. Okay, so uh, the French call this particular mushroom species Trompette de la mort, but that's just because it's black. It's actually a totally safe mushroom with no uh, poisonous lookalikes. This is the black trumpet chanterelle, and I've definitely found these in North Quabbin. And, the, and they come out in July into August. And the toughest part about these mushrooms is seeing the first one because of the color, because they're black and they're diminutive. They're only about two or three inches tall. So the tricky part is finding the very first one. Once you find the first one, though, just stop in your tracks and look around, and often you'll find dozens of them, sometimes hundreds of them. And, uh, and one nice thing about that is if you do uh, strike gold, as it were, and you find a lot of these, uh, you can dry them uh, in a food dehydrator and then store them in your pantry for years if you can't eat them all fresh right away. And the drying actually concentrates the flavors. So that's the black chanterelle mushroom. So here is a, a sweet tooth or hedgehog mushroom, and it's got kind of a felty feeling to the top. And when you flip it upside down, you see teeth like the roof of a cave. There are no poisonous tooth mushrooms. There are some that are bitter and don't taste good, but there aren't any that would make you sick. And, uh, and this one can occasionally be bitter, but usually it's really yummy. And I typically find them under hemlocks toward the end of the summer. Okay, the only lookalike to the mushroom in the center of this photo is a volleyball. That is a giant puffball mushroom. And, um, and for puffballs, what you want to do is just make sure they're nice and firm. And when you cut into them, they need to be white. They can't be green or yellow or any other color. And you want the outside of the puffball to be smooth or relatively smooth. You don't want it to be warty. And... Um, and mush puffball mushrooms are kind of like the tofu of the mushroom world. They tend not to have a lot of flavor themselves, uh, but some people like them. And the giant puffball mushroom, a standard way to cook a mushroom like that is to cut it into half inch thick pieces, into half inch thick slices, and roll it into a beaten egg and then into some seasoned breadcrumbs or cracker crumbs and fry it in a skillet and some butter, make country fried puffball steaks. And that one mushroom can easily feed everybody in that photo. And this, by the way, this is not a particularly large giant puffball mushroom. I've seen them at least twice as big. All right, here is a porcini mushroom. These grow in the North Quabbin. It's in the boli grouping of mushrooms. And the key thing to look for on the bolis is underneath the cap, once again, no gills. This is a spongy layer underneath here. And for the Boletus edulis, or the porcini mushroom, this color is white on a young specimen. And when they get older, mature specimen, that color turns an olive yellow. They're edible either way. So older, it's olive yellow, and then younger, it's white. And, the, uh, and also, the color of the cap is the same color as a loaf of baked bread. So you want to look for that. And then on the, uh, the key distinguishing feature of the Boletus edulis is 
this pattern right here, which is called a reticulation. It looks like somebody took a piece of gauze and wrapped the top of the stock with it. It's this very finely meshed pattern. And the key thing, it is white because the lookalike you're likely to run into of the Boletus edulis is a mushroom called the bitter bolete, where although the cap is brown, uh, this color of the pores tends to be pink and this color on the stalk is brown. And bitter boletes aren't poisonous, they just taste bitter to most people, so they're not worth eating. All right, so I hope you find this many uh, uh, Boletus edulis later this summer. Okay, so this is a really fun one. I find these on oak trees. This is called the beefsteak mushroom, and the only lookalike is a piece of meat hanging on a tree. There's no other things that look like this. So, so that's what they look like, and it's called fistulana hepatica because they often have this uh, liver type shape. Uh, and I've cut into this one. You can see it has marbling just like a piece of meat. When you squeeze it, red juice comes out like a piece of meat. So, um, so, uh, my, so far, my favorite way of cooking this mushroom is just to brush it with a little uh, teriyaki sauce and grill it on a hibachi just like a piece of meat. So no poisonous lookalikes to this one. All right, this is a fun one. Um, and uh, I have found this in the North Quab and it's not very common though. So I've gone years without finding this one, which is a shame because it's one of my favorites. So this is a photo taken many years ago. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an updated version of this photo. Same species of mushroom though. It looks like a mass of yellowy egg noodles, often at the base of a pine tree, often around Labor Day. So that's when to look for it. There's no poisonous lookalikes. And when you cook it up, it tastes like mushroomy egg noodles. So it's really good. All right, this one I've definitely found in North Quabbin. Uh, so I hope you all can find this one. This is called a bear's head tooth. Sometimes it's called a lion's mane. Uh, that's the cultivated name for it. It is a mushroom that is cultivated, uh, but it does occur in the wild. And it looks like a frozen waterfall hanging on a tree. And usually it's a... Uh, beech tree, and it often is at eye level as this one was. And the texture of this mushroom is very similar to crab meat. So, um, so it's fun to eat that way, uh, like in an omelet or any way that you use crab meat in a cooked dish. And uh, all right, so that's the bear's head too. So look for that one on beech trees or beech logs. That's when I typically see it. And there is a closely related species called the comb tooth, uh, that is also white with teeth hanging down. It tends to be more of a horizontal mushroom than a vertical mushroom, but that one is also equally edible. All right, so this is probably the most bizarre organism in the show. This is corn smut. This is a fungus that gets into ripening ears of corn, and this is what it does to the kernels. It swells them and turns them gray, and I have to admit this is not the most appetizing thing I thought of ever putting into my mouth, but you can see I'm very excited to have found this because uh, I was aware that in Mexico, this is considered a delicacy. In fact, uh, during the days of the Aztecs, that if you found corn smut growing on your corn, you weren't even allowed to touch it. You'd have to send for an emissary of the emperor and have them collect it, and they'd take it off to the royal courts, and only the royalty could eat it. So I thought, all right, it must be good. So I brought it home. I chopped it up, cooked it as you would a standard mushroom, little butter, little onion, and I took a bite and it tasted like mud. And I thought, what is the big deal about this stuff? So I tried it one more time and I cooked it in a Mexican style with some hot peppers, some, some poblano chiles. And there's some kind of chemical transformation that happens with the capsaicin and the hot peppers and the corn smut and that made it taste good. So that's the advice I give you if you wanna try eating this one. So hen of the woods mushrooms do occur in the summer but now we're, we're grading into a little bit early fall. So I will see these anytime from like September 15th through October 15th. And these also like to grow near oak trees at the base of oak trees. And the older and bigger the oak tree is, the more likely you are to find these. And it's not that uncommon to find three, four or more of these around just one tree. So here's a closer look at what other, so this one I picked in the North Quabbin area. And, um, and this uh, mushroom, uh, at the very least, you can trim the outer mushroom meat off of it, even if the core might be a little bit woody. And it has a very meaty uh, flavor to it, almost like liver. 
Uh, and I find the older specimens a little bit too strongly flavored. So I actually like to harvest this mushroom when it's younger. So now let me just say there are lookalikes to this mushroom. There's, you know, the, going back to the sulfur shelf, and this is a relative of the sulfur shelf, is um, uh, this one has lookalikes. Fortunately, nothing poisonous, but uh, uh, I often see people confuse this with the black stating polypore or the Berkeley's polypore. So uh, those are out in the summer, and this is more of a late summer, early fall thing. And as I was saying, they can be strongly flavored when they're mature like this. So I tend to harvest them at what I would call the chick of the woods or the chick stage, when this entire mushroom is only about five inches across. And at this stage, the whole mushroom is nice and mild, and even the core of it is very tender. So that's when I like to gather it. So uh, if this was a live program, and I'd be asking you all in the audience, what is this plant? This is wild rice. And wild rice does grow in Massachusetts. I've never harvested myself, but I do know people that have. And it often grows along rivers. And the time to harvest it is the tail end of the summer. And uh, if you want to do it the authentic way, like these Native Americans are doing, the Ojibwe Indians, is you paddle your canoe into the wild rice patch. And then you use these sticks, which are called knockers, and you bend the ripe rice plants with one knocker over the boat and then you whack it with the other knocker and the ripe grains fall into the boat. And that's how you, so, so at this stage, you can't just eat it though. You have to parch these grains and then winnow them. And I've just never gone through all that trouble, but that's, uh, so I buy my wild rice from the Ojibwe Indians, but I do know people that have gathered and processed their own wild rice in New England. So you could do that too, if you wanted to. And the time to gather it is September. All right, sumac. So if you've been afraid of sumac and wondered about, uh, is this the dreaded poison sumac? I'm happy to say that you were wrong. Any sumac with these tight, bright clusters of red berries is not only not poison sumac, these are edible sumacs. And I'll talk about them in a second. But first of all, I want to show you what poison sumac berries look like. And I have seen poison sumac in the North Quabbin, so it does grow there. That's what poison sumac berries look like. They're drooping, loose clusters of white berries. So uh, you don't have to worry about any sumac that has these tight upper clusters of red berries. So, so in Massachusetts, we have the staghorn sumac, which you're seeing here. There's also the wing sumac and the smooth sumac. They all have tight upright clusters of red berries. And the main thing you do with them is you make a drink from them. And this is all explained in my book, but I'll just cover it briefly here. So what you do is uh, pick the ripe berry clusters off the plants. And I gather about a dozen of these for every a gallon of water I want to flavor. And by the way, these will be ripe about a month from now, uh, so midsummer, and then um, they'll retain their ripeness through at least Labor Day and sometimes uh, a month or so later after that. So pull off the plant, then bring them home and throw them in a bucket or a bowl of water, and then knead the berry clusters in the water like you were kneading bread dough. And you're rubbing the flavoring off the berries and getting into the liquid, and the liquid will turn this pinkish orange color. Then fish out the berries, get rid of them, and then take that liquid and pour it through any kind of a filter, like a paper towel. And what goes through the filter, you can drink hot or cold, sweetened or unsweetened. And I tend to drink it cold and sweetened like lemonade. So here you see the um, sumac aid, and the entire time it takes from uh, gathering the fruit to uh, drinking the drink can be as little as a half an hour. Okay, so wild grapes, I keep standing up because it's got a little cramp in my leg here. So I'm gonna keep talking while I rub my leg, and then you'll see my face again uh, once the cramp has subsided here. Okay, so wild grapes. Uh, I, uh, I know many of you in the North Quabbin area have had this wonderful experience where you're walking and riding your bike along uh, second, third week of September, and all of a sudden, grapes, grapes, where's that smell coming from? And then you fall your nose to the vine and find these fox grapes uh, dripping, the vines dripping with these ripe fruits, and then just stuff your face right by the vine, which is a lot of fun. So you can eat these fruits raw. You can do various things with them. What I typically do uh, with the fruits that I uh, pick, it, and it's very common in my car to have baskets full of ripe grapes in September uh, that I gather in Central Mass. And so uh, what I'll do with these grapes at this point is just bring them home and throw them in a big pot with some water and simmer them for a while to soften them up and then put everything through a food mill or a sieve in the food mill 
holds back all the skins and seeds and all the juice and pulp goes through. And then I'll pour it into a tall container like a pitcher and the, and the puree will separate on you. And the top part will be this delicious wild grape juice, which you can drink just plain. And the bottom part will be thick. And that's what you use as the raw material for making grape jam, grape jelly, grape sorbet, grape chiffon pie, stuff like that. Uh, or grape cheesecake, uh, which is really yummy. The other species, and I found this one in North Quab, and this is the Riverside grape. And these grapes are edible too, but they're smaller and they're not quite as yummy as the fox grape. But these leaves are relatively delicate. And so this is the species of grape that some people like to collect for making stuffed grape leaves. And I'm happy to tell you that in the North Quabbin area, it's not too late to be gathering wild grape leaves for stuffing. So you want to look for leaves like this. And actually, you can use any species of grape you want to stuff. I just like these riverside grape leaves because they're, uh, they're not woolly in the underside like the fox grape leaves are. These are very delicate. And I find that you just blanch these leaves, drop them into boiling water for just 20 seconds, and they will, that will soften them enough so they won't tear when you stuff them. And we just had these for supper the other day, and they were really good. Uh, and here are the stuffed grape leaves, which you can make yourself. It's really fun. Uh, I mean, eventually, uh, you know, we'll be relatively back to normal enough to have, you know, a couple friends over for dinner. And, you know, if you have that dinner around this time of year, you could serve them grape leaves that you pick and stuff yourself, which is really fun. Let me tell you one other thing you can do with grape leaves. And as far as I know, any species of grape leaf works. So if you make pickles and you take grape leaves and you put a grape leaf in each jar where you're putting those pickles in, those pickles will come out crisper because that grape leaf was in there. And I think it's because of the tartaric acid that's in the grape leaves. All right, here is a native species called groundnut. And this one's actually edible year round. It's just, this is what it looks like in the summer when the plants are blooming. And then uh, it produces these uh, uh, beans later. And I guess you probably could eat the little peas inside these beans. But when I find these, I let them mature and then I grow plants from the beans to propagate my nursery. Here's the main edible part of the plant. It's these tubers. And these are available year round. And what you can do is slice these tubers and then um, fry them in a little vegetable oil till they crisp up and look like this and make fried groundnut chips. And they're very good that way. All right, here are hazelnuts. And there's two species of hazelnuts that grow in the North Quabbin. And I have seen uh, good amounts of hazelnuts in the North Quabbin. So there's the common hazelnut where the husk looks like a little head of cabbage. There's a little more than an inch of diameter. And when you see this brown color there, that tells you that the nut inside is getting ripe. And you see the little nuts peek out right there as the husk ripens. And sometimes the nuts fall right out of the husk on the ground. And then there's also this uh, beaked hazelnut, which also occurs in North Quabbin. And the nut is inside this thing. And there's a strange thing sticking out of it that looks like a bird's beak. So that's why these are called the beaked hazelnuts. And all this text in the bottom is talking about how to propagate hazelnuts from seed. And the key thing to remember is don't let the nuts dry out, which you would do usually to eat them. But if you ever want to propagate a nut uh, tree from a nut that you gather, don't let that nut dry out or it will lose its viability. All right, so uh, I'm gonna tell you two very important tips for gathering hazelnuts. The first thing is when to look for them and the second thing is where to look for them. When to look for them is the second week of September. And what you want to do is look for bushes where the nuts in their husks are still attached to the bushes. So you want to find them as close to ripe as possible, but still attach the bushes. Because if you wait until the nuts fall off the bushes, you will never find any. The squirrels and chipmunks will get all of them before you do. So I will harvest them as close to ripe as possible, bring them home and spread them out on a cookie sheet. Uh, I'm sorry, on a newspaper in my garage and just let this husk turn brown. It takes two or three weeks. And then the nut inside falls out of the husk and that's what you uh, would eat. Or, or uh, refrigerate immediately or so if you want to grow hazelnuts from these plants. And where I look for them is under power lines. And I don't think it's the electromagnetic radiation. I think it's just all the sun that the plants get under the power lines that uh, uh, helps produce good crops. And also, um, if you're a squirrel or a chipmunk, being out underneath a high voltage power line is kind of a scary place to be because 
these uh, corridors are pretty wild and they're exposed and, you know, a hawk or a snake or a fox or somebody that wants to eat you can see you better. So it's harder for the squirrels and chipmunks to work these bushes as assiduously as they would if the hazelnut were growing in the woods. So that's the key. Look for hazelnuts out in the open and under power lines is a great place to look for them. And most power line companies don't mine hazelnuts because they know these trees are diminutive and they're never gonna get tall enough to short out the wires. So they tolerate the presence of the hazelnuts there, which is great for us. Okay, so acorns are edible. All, a, all oak trees produce acorns and all acorns are edible. And it's just the big issue is how much do you have to leach the acorn nut meats to reduce the tannic acid level to low enough so that the nut meats are palatable. And in general, the nut meats from the white oak acorns, the ones with rounded lobes on the leaves, tend to have lower levels of tannic acid in, in the acorns. So those are the ones that I tend to use. But, but uh, people in Northern New England tend to use the red oak acorns because that, that's just a more common species up there and it's easier to gather those acorns. Uh, but either way is fine. And you can use a hot water method or a cold water method to leach out the, uh, the uh, uh, tannic acid from the acorns. Uh, and then you can grind them up in a food processor and use the acorn nut meal uh, for baking, like making acorn bread, acorn muffins, stuff like that. Okay, here is my number one favorite wild edible out of everything that exists. And I'm happy to tell you these grow in the North Quabbin and in similar areas to the East and West in Worcester County, Franklin County and stuff like that. This is the shagbark hickory. So this park bark pattern isn't a seasonal phenomenon. That's what the bark looks like all the time. So I keep track of where those trees are any time of year I see them. And then I start checking them second or third week September. So toward the end of the summer is the beginning of shagbark hickory season. And each nut will have this four part green husk surrounding it. But often when this falls off the tree, so you don't have to pick these off the tree like you do with the hazelnuts, wait till these hit the ground. And often this part bursts right off. And so you just see the hickory nuts without the husk around them, just piled up along the side of the road or underneath the tree, whatever. So where are you going to have your best luck finding hickory nuts? Where the trees are growing on the edge of the, whoops, sorry, on the edge of the field, in the middle of the field, um, that's where you're going to see them. And, uh, and this is also a very common sight. Uh, baskets like this filled in my car from the shagbark hickory nuts. This is my number one favorite nut. And that's what the nut meats look like. They taste like uh, walnuts that's been lightly sprayed with maple syrup. So they're better than walnuts in virtually any recipe where you'd call walnuts uh, or pecans, in my opinion. So here is a maple hickory nut pie. This recipe is my book. This is the New England version of pecan pie. And virtually everybody I serve this pie to say this is better than pecan pie. Um, it does take a cup and three quarters of these hickory nuts. So it takes a little while to shell these nuts, but I think it's worth it. Um, and then were this a live program, I probably wouldn't make you a pie because it's a little bit high to serve. It's hard to serve pie to a group, but I would have made you probably one of these three uh, cookies uh, like these triple maple hickory nut sandwich cookies or these hickory nut wafer cookies. So that is the one drawback of these virtual presentations since I can't serve you sumac aid or, or hickory nut cookies or other fun things. And that's how I typically end my public programs, live person programs with some uh, tasty treats to nibble and sip on. So with that, that is the end of my show. So I hope you enjoyed it. And, um, and I'll just briefly say, here's my uh, website. So if you click on this, this is where you can see the other places I'll be doing these virtual programs or in-person hikes. And there's my email if you have any questions that you can't think about uh, right now to ask in the chat function. Uh, just ask me later. And this book, uh, which was published by another regional land trust in Massachusetts called the Essex County Greenbelt Association. This is the land trust that covers Northeast Massachusetts. And they allow foraging as a printed activity on all their properties that are open to the public. And I'm so grateful for that. I give them all the money the book makes. So if you buy a book, whether you buy it from Greenbelt or, or any other way, like, you know, if this were a live program, I'd just sell you a book at the end of my talk. But unfortunately, I can't do that through the internet. Uh, so you can get them from Greenbelt 
Uh, it's a little um, uh, tricky now because their office is closed with the pandemic and everything. So if you want a book mailed to you, you can order it from B Street Books. But I'm hoping that later on this summer, Greenwell will be able to mail books again and you can just go to uh, their website. So with that, thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Russ. Wow. Uh, I live in, well, I'm currently in Rockport, Mass, which has a lot of Greenbelt properties around and they all have staghorn sumac. So right, I know what I'm right. going to be doing in yeah. a month. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. So we definitely have a few questions within the chat here. Russ, did you say mustard flowers when yes. talking about Yes. So, um, so, you know, where I was today, I saw mustards blooming. So I guess I could have included that as a summer wild edibles uh, option. Um, so I'm happy to tell you there are no poisonous species in the mustard family that grow around here. So if it's a mustard, uh, it's, if it's in that family, it's edible. And plants are grouped into families by flower structure. So that's how you pick out a member of the mustard family. So you want to look for a flower where there are four petals in the shape of a cross. That's where the expression cruciferous, cruciferous vegetables comes from. And if you have sharp eyes, look inside that flower and you'll see three pairs of stamens, two pairs of long ones and one pair of short ones that are tucked into the base of the flower. And the combination of that flower structure and the broccoli, radishy flavored in the plant, that tells you it's a member of the mustard family. And that's all you need to know to know that it's safe to eat. And whether or not you eat it and how you use the flower just depends on the flavor. And I bet uh, if you're doing some invasive species removal, garlic mustard is also yes. uh, right. a good plant Yeah, so that use. would be a spring foraging opportunity. So not on my show tonight. Right, right. Um, another question is, are there any lookalikes for the Indian cucumber? Oh, uh, there is a plant called star flower that people often see and say, oh, that's an e-cucumber. Starflower is more common and they often share similar habitats. If you look carefully at a starflower leaf, you'll see that it has a central vein to it with side veins coming off kind of like a uh, feather, whereas Indian cucumber has parallel veins. And there is a basic botanical reason for that. And it tells you that they're actually from very different branches of the plant world, although the plants bear a superficial resemblance. Uh, starflower is a dicot and any cucumber is a monocot. So that might mean some of you that have a smattering of knowledge about botany. Uh, the other thing is if you pull a starflower plant up, there's no uh, you know, big white uh, taproot there or a, a, a root that grows uh, perpendicular to the ground uh, to nibble on like an Indian cucumber. So you'd learn quickly it was not an Indian cucumber. Does jewelweed usually grow near poison ivy? Yes, it often does. Although I would say that poison ivy is more common than jewelweed. Poison ivy can grow <laughs> everywhere. And poison ivy, as you probably know, assumes all kinds of shapes and disguises. It's quite a clever plant in terms of, uh, you know, uh, blending in, you know, even in the winter time, if you rub against it or dig where the roots are, you can still get the rash just from touching the twigs. So it's a tricky plant. Yeah, so it is convenient that jewelweed often grows near where poison ivy grows. Yeah, the antidote is always near the poison, apparently. Well, uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so some, uh, we didn't talk about stinging nettle today because stinging nettle is more of a spring edible, but some people will use the jewelweed juice to help reduce the sting from stinging nettle too. Hmm. Do spice bush female plants have fruits every year? Usually, um, yes. Eva has around 20 plants, but only she's finding two bushes with berries. Yeah, she could have 18 male plants and two female plants. That would be very sad. Yeah. Uh, so you can tell them apart by the flowers in the spring. So what I suggest that she do is tie a little bit of flagging tape to the plants that produce berries this year. And then next spring, look at the flowers those plants produce and compare those to the flowers of the other plants and see if I'm right that she has two female plants and 18 male plants. I could be wrong and she's got some female plants that for some reason are producing fruit, but that would be, you know, usually I see them produce the fruit. Any tips on finding wild leeks? So wild leeks tend to like a less acidic soil than we have in North Quabbin. 
So uh, you will see those uh, in southern Worcester County, uh, in uh, eastern Connecticut, but more likely you run into them in western New England. So uh, Berkshire County or western Vermont, where uh, there's a more limestone-based soil and the pH is uh, higher than what we have in North Quabbin. The lookalike that you might see in the North Quabbin is a plant called Clintonia or blue bead lily, which is also edible. It's the young leaves though of the Clintonia, which are, are only available in the spring when they're two or three inches tall. So that's why it wasn't in my summer edibles talk because it's only edible uh, when it first comes up. This time of year when the leaves are mature and like nine or 10 inches long, the leaves aren't tasty and the berries are never worth eating. What tree smells like lemon and has a green seed pod? Oh, Louise uh, is in Webster, Massachusetts. Yeah. So if that person is talking about a plant that's blooming now, it's probably a basswood tree. And I could, I should have put that uh, plant in my show because it is blooming in North Quabbin right now. Both the basswood and then the uh, uh, introduced species from Europe, the really common street tree called the uh, uh, Tilia cordata or the little leaf linden. Uh, and either way, they're edible both ways. So one edible part is in the spring when the leaves first come out, you can eat the leaves. And then this time of year, very beginning of the summer, you can make a tea from those flowers, which have a lemon honey type smell. And you can use the flowers fresh or dried. And it has a wonderful flavor. And it also has two medicinal values. It's soothing to your digestive system and your mental state at the same time. So it's very highly regarded by herbalists for that reason. So once again, that's the Tilia uh, americana, the American basswood is the uh, native species and the Tilia cordata is the most common non-native species of uh, the um, linden tree. Both grow in Massachusetts and both are quite common. Are sulfur shelf mushrooms that grow in evergreens unsafe to eat? Yes, I think so. Um, I almost never run into them, but uh, the standard advice I've heard from mushroom hunters is to stay away from sulfur shelves that grow on conifers, but um, yeah. it's, it's much, much more likely you're going to find them growing on oak trees than on conifers. Yeah, I mean, if it's a stump, sometimes you can't tell. But. That's true. That's true. So um, now this is a good this is a good opportunity to talk about a larger issue, which is allergies. It is possible that you could be allergic to an edible wild plant or mushroom and not know it simply because you've never been exposed to that particular species before. So the standard advice is to not eat a huge amount of some new food you're trying for the very first time. Eat a modest amount just to make sure you don't break all out in hives or whatever. But if generally speaking, you're not allergic to conventional foods, you're probably not allergic to their wild counterparts, their wild relatives, because chemically speaking, they'd be very similar. And mushrooms that grow on uh, live or dead trees, which ones do you prefer? And does oh, it matter? Uh, th no, there's no difference because uh, usually if you see a mushroom growing on wood, it's living on the dead wood in the inside of the tree. It's not living on the live wood. There are many mushrooms that are connected to live trees, but almost all those mushrooms are, uh, have the mycorrhizal association. So it's actually the white thread-like mass that's growing in the ground that's connected to the tree's root system. Those mushrooms growing on live trees aren't growing directly on the tree they're usually growing on, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the ground. Now, one exception to that would be like uh, oyster mushrooms. We'd see an oyster mushroom growing on, let's say a live maple tree. But the oyster mushroom, once again, is growing on the uh, dead wood in the center of the tree. It's not growing on the live wood. Are all the plants you've discussed in your presentation tonight native to New England? No, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's many, uh, and I'm sorry, I wasn't precise about that. So uh, among all the plants that are out there that are edible, we have many yummy edible native species, but we have lots of edible non-native species too. Uh, but my attitude about the non-native species are, in many cases, they offer guilt-free foraging opportunities because they don't have important ecological roles in the environment. So let's go back on my show. Let me find an example of an edible non-native species so you can know what I'm talking about here because uh, I don't want to be wrong about the point I just made. It'd be pretty funny if I just happened <laughs> to include only native species in this show because that was not my intention. 
So let's see, what's non-native here? Anything? Not so far. Everything's okay. native so far. Still looking, still looking, still looking, still looking. Daylilies, there we go. Okay, daylilies are not native. They're from China. And they were brought here to the North Quabbin going way back to the colonial period where people grew them uh, just for their ornamental value. They had no clue they were edible. Uh, just to look at them, in fact, uh, as some of you may know, one of the fun things to do sometimes, you could be hiking in the woods and find a patch of daylilies way off in the middle of the woods and say, how did daylilies get way off in the middle of the woods? And I pretty much guarantee that if you look hard enough, you will find a house foundation very close to where those daylilies are, that they are a remnant persistent population of flowers that were planted for when there was a farmhouse there. And the farmhouse has fallen down and since rotted away, but the daylilies are still there. Now there's a lot of daylilies out by the street near my house. Right. And obviously they're for ornamentals, but now right. I'm gonna start right. being picky. Should I pick them on the roadside or should I really oh, okay. look for Okay, very ones good point. So, yes, yeah. So, um, I mean, North Quabbin area has got lots of wonderful rural roadsides where the traffic mm. volume is really, really light. So I don't worry that much about accumulated automobile exhaust and brake linings and stuff like that. Yeah, but on a heavily traveled roadway, that is an issue and I would be concerned about that. And also, we even talk so much about where to pick and not pick, but you know, uh, if you're gonna pick daylilies, you probably don't wanna pick the daylilies that are going next to your neighbor's mailbox. You want to, unless the neighbor says, fine, go ahead. Uh, so ideally, if it's possible, uh, it's great to find out who owns the land and ask permission before you start foraging there. Right, right. And one really great thing about that is that you can forge in a really joyful way then. You don't have to be kind of looking over your shoulder thinking, is anybody going to you know, be mad at me for picking this here? And they're the same as tiger lilies? No, or they're different? no tiger lilies is a different species. So yeah, make sure they're day lilies. And if you're not sure, uh, then find a, you know, a horticulturalist that knows the difference. So one of the ways to identify daylilies, and I'm sorry it doesn't show in this photo, is if you look at the base of the plant, the long leaves crease in half and they fold in half as the leaf goes down into the base of the plant. So my recollection is that tiger lilies have whorls of leaves, more like the Indian cucumber, and daylilies have basil leaves, and the flowers are on these long leafless stalks. Is there a special me method that you have for shelling hickory nuts. Yes, okay, I'm gonna tell you my secret. So, so here's a typical hickory nut. You see they've got points to it. And ordinarily when they lie flat on the ground, the points come to the side like that. And this is the, the flat side. There is a steep side. So what I do is actually tip this nut 90 degrees. So the points are still pointing out to the sides like this, but it's steep. So you actually have to hold it that way with one hand. And the surface isn't a wooden board like it is here. It's a hard surface like a rock. And then you take a hammer and you hit right there on the top of the nut and you don't pulverize it, but you hit just hard enough to send cracks through the shell. And more often than not, uh, the shell opens up uh, in a way that you can extract entire halves out of that shell that way. So you don't have to spend all day with the nut pick picking into every nook and cranny. Now I'd be misleading you if I told you I never have to use a nut pick. I definitely do, but I'd have to say that for every uh, cup of hickory nuts that I shell, one third of what's left over are nuts that are completely free from the shelf that you can just uh, eat on the spot. Mm -hmm. I tend to toast them for a few minutes. Like if you're gonna put shagbark hickories on your cereal in the morning, it's really nice to just throw them in the toaster oven and toast them uh, for a few minutes because that helps bring out the flavor. And they are uh, truly yummy. And would you bash open the shell if you were trying to plant them? No, no, them. no, because that doesn't happen in nature. There's right. nobody around with a hammer to open up the nuts in nature. Well, no, squirrels the, might what, have really yes. strong teeth. So what a squirrel know? or a chipmunk does is they plant this entire thing. So they put this in their mouth and run around and find a piece of ground and bury this about an inch down, which is just the right depth, by the way, where you want to bury a nut. And then, uh, and they have the best of intentions to come and gather it the following spring and eat it, but they often forget. And boy, am I grateful for the forgetful squirrels and chipmunks because that is 
a major reason why we've got hickory nuts and hazelnuts and our other nut trees out in the landscape because of uh, forgetful squirrels and chipmunks. Again, Russ, thank you so much for taking time out of sure, your day. Sure, well, thanks for the invite today. and happy foraging, everybody. Enjoy the summer. All right. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Happy summer.